Go ahead and be seated. I am so glad to see you today. Glad to see you uh, at home as well. I want you to know that I'm watching you. We have special cameras on you, so, so uh, you better pay attention. We're just watching you. So uh, I am just, I'm just delighted to teach on this subject matter today. We're starting a brand new series called Next Level, and today we come to our connection to Jesus. And we're going to talk about John 15 today. And I, I just want to tell you that John 15 is, in my opinion, probably the most important teaching that Jesus did as it relates to how then do I walk with God. This is such a powerful and amazing uh, text of Scripture. And I, and I don't want you to see it as an academic study. What I want you to do is I, I want you to remember, this is Jesus. He sits down with his disciples, and he's teaching them what it literally means to engage with God. How do I do that? How do I bear fruit in my life? What, is you, what do you want from me, God? That's what Jesus now is explaining to those who are following him, and that's what he's going to explain to us today. This is how I actually follow Jesus in every area of my life. So today we're going to talk about this connection that we have to Jesus. What's the basis of it? And in this, in this series we're doing uh, next level. We're going to talk about connections at every level, but we're going to start with our connection to Jesus. So I want to start with this question, uh, and this is a legit question. I hope you answer it legitimately. Do you want to have more joy in your life? Anybody here want more joy in your life? I mean, I know I do. I think, how many need to have more joy in your life? I mean, I think all of us need more joy in our life. How about this? Do you want to have more power in your life? Do you want to have the power of Jesus Christ inside of your life? Do you want that for your life? I mean, I think, again, all of us want that. And, and again, do you want to have fruit, actual fruit in your life that, that God produces and that remains and stays and, and glorifies God? And, and uh, those are the things that we're going to, I'm going to show you today how that every Christ follower can actually have those things inside of their life. And all of these things are available to us as explained by Jesus, and I want you to forget that I'm teaching this passage. This is Jesus. This is Jesus' sermon, not mine. I'm stealing it from him. He told me it was okay, just so you know, and I'm just going to teach what he taught to his disciples. So let's start in John chapter 15, verse number one, and this is what it says. Jesus says, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He's now talking about a vineyard. He's relating the Christian life to a vineyard. He lifts up every branch of mine that does not produce fruit, and he prunes the branches uh, that do to bear more fruit, so they will produce even more fruit. So there's this, there's this thing that God does in our life. This is amazing. There are, there are three simple things that I want to show you, simple things that are life-changing. These aren't mine. These are Jesus's. This is what Jesus says. But if you will look at these three simple connections, I'm telling you, you're going to have a life that is on steroids when it comes to the idea of the power of God, the fruit of God, the, the joy of the Lord inside of your life. So I want you to see this first simple connection. This is the first thing that we have to understand is that Jesus says that he is the true vine. Jesus says that he is the true vine. Now I want you to underscore the idea of true there because uh, first of all, let's talk about what this vine represents. This vine in a vineyard is the source of all life. So Jesus is saying here that he is the source of of all life, but he wants you to understand, he wants you and me both to understand that he is the only source of true life. He is the true vine. And if there's a true vine, then there are counterfeit vines, right? If Jesus is emphasizing true here, that means that you and I must be, must be prone to being deceived into trusting into something else besides Jesus for our source of life. That's what he's saying. In China, there stands a structure of St. Paul's Cathedral. It stands as a symbol, in my opinion, of a false vine. There's a true vine, there's a false vine. From the front, it appears to be a towering cathedral, a magnificent house of prayer and worship, but after centuries of ruin and neglect, all that remains are the iconic stone frontage and the grand staircases, staircase leading up to it. 
And if you just, from a distance, if you step back and you look at this thing, it, you must think, wow, what a magnificent thing. And then the closer you get, the, you realize that this is just a facade. This is, there's no substance to it. There's just a wall. You walk through the doors, you walk through the gates, and you realize there's nothing on the back side. It's just a wall. And it just has an appearance of something powerful or something beautiful or something that is meant to draw us to God. But the reality is it has no ability to ever, to ever, ever bring it home for us. A false vine has an appearance of substance, but in the end has no power in our lives. In addition to things like false religions and those kinds of things, there are also false vines that are more subtle than that, things that you and I are subject to, things that secretly suffocate us spiritually. So let me see if I can tell you a few of those. Things like money. Do you understand that money is a false vine? It has the power, it has the power to do a little but not much, and the reality is that it can't, it can't deliver. Uh, how about just the idea of sex or body image or misplaced pleasure or, or just the idea of power itself, self-image. All those things cannot deliver, but they are things that we've substituted in our culture for really a source of life. So when I'm going after, and by the way, none of those things that I just mentioned, well, most of them that I just mentioned aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves. It's that in our culture, we have substituted those things for God Body image is a big deal in our culture, right? You get on social media and, you know, everybody wants a body like Pastor Dan. I don't understand it. I don't get it. You know, I just don't understand that. But, you know, body image, body image is, a, I'm kidding. Some of you are going, no, I don't. I'm, and I'm glad. But body image is a big deal in our culture. And maybe it's a, listen to this carefully, maybe it's a source of a false vine when that becomes the source of my life, when Jesus is put in a secondary position to those things. All these things come from a, a, from a false sense of what really, truly gives life itself. Jesus is the only true vine. He is not one of the true vines. That's not what he's saying. He's not one of many options. He is the only source of life. And he's already said, if we just go back a chapter, he's already said in chapter 14, verse 6, he says, he says this in a different way, but, but this is what he says. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see that? I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the source of life, and no one comes unto the Father except through him. That's what he says, except through me. He's the only source of life. So the, the simple truth is, is that Jesus is the true vine and you and I need to recognize it, acknowledge it, and plug ourselves into the true vine. The second simple truth is that God wants abundant fruit in our lives. God wants to produce in your life more than what's going on right now in your life. Do you believe that? God wants to do more than you could imagine. He wants to produce fruit in your life in such a way that the people around you will scratch their head and say, how could God use such a simple person like that in such a magnificent way? And the, the, if, you don't, you know, if you're saying, well, wait a second, Pastor Dan, you just slammed me. I'm saying that's what all of us are. We, we're nothing in God's sight. So for God to use us, for God to use us, is just an amazing miracle in and of itself. So God wants to produce this, this abundant fruit in my life. He wants spiritual fruit, not religious fanatics or nuts. He, just, he doesn't want them. And so then he goes on, and this is what he says. And again, these are the words of Jesus. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he lifts up. Now, if you're reading along in your own version... You know, amen, I'm glad you brought your Bible. You should bring your Bible to church. But I'm gonna show you something from your version. Uh, your version might say, he takes away. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. But I wanna suggest to you, the word I wrote there can be either translated lifts up or takes away. And I think what has happened here is that the old King James had an influence on a lot of the other translations and they just naturally assumed that that was, that was the way you should translate that verse. But the fact is, if you just go to a vineyard, you know how a vineyard works. This is how it works. You, you, know, you take the shoot and, uh, and, and, and when it begins to bear fruit or maybe it begins to bear a little fruit, what the farmer does, what the, what the person 
tending the vineyard does is that he lifts it up and lifts it up and stakes it to stakes. And if you drive through Napa, what you'll see is a lot of grapevines staked up. That's the concept of John chapter 15. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit. Notice the key phrase is every branch in me that does not bear fruit. The concept of in me means that this is, a, this is someone who is actually connected to the vine. So every branch that is connected to Jesus, he lifts up and every branch that does not bear fruit, he prunes that it might bear more fruit. God's purpose for you by any means is to get you to bear fruit inside of you, your life. Fruit that comes from the Holy Spirit cannot be faked. I'm just telling you, listen carefully. This is not fruit that you can fake. This is not fr fruit that you produce. This is fruit that's produced in you by God himself. This isn't you acting out. This isn't you doing, getting up and saying, you know, I'm gonna love people more. This isn't any of that. This is the idea of God, of me being in, the, in this vine, and I, I, you know, I'm just the branch, and all God does in my life is he uses me to produce the fruit. That's it. So I'm just the branch. I'm not the fruit producer. I'm just the one who God produces the fruit on, my, on, on me. So it is not fruit. Uh, if it's not of the Holy Spirit, you, you just simply cannot fake it. It is not your fruit. It is his fruit. It is not your will. It's his will. And if you've ever been on our campus, if you've are if you been off campus for a while, if you've been on our campus on our north parking lot, we actually planted a vineyard up there. And uh, you can see it this afternoon as you leave. And, uh, and so just for the record, we did not, we're not starting a winery. Okay? I don't think. I'm just kidding. We are not start, starting a winery. We are creating an image for you to see. We're, we're giving you something to look at as you see John 15. So we've created that. And here's the, the bottom line. Anybody who grow, grows grapes knows this, is that you don't actually receive the fruit of that vine probably for about four years. So it's about a four-year process. The first year you cut it back. The second year you cut it back. And, and eventually you'll get to the place where you have this abundant uh, vine that's producing fruit. That's the nature of it. So our responsibility is to abide in him. We'll get to that in just a second. And, and uh, the fact is, here's the million-dollar question, is that will you wait on God to produce fruit? Will you wait on God? Will you abide in him so that fruit can be produced in your life? So let's just take a time out. This is how normally it happens. So how many of you all have sin in your life? Just raise your hand. Everybody should have their hands raised, okay? So here's how the process normally goes in our lives. So normally what happens is we, com we commit an act of sin and uh, we have some level of remorse, I hope, Maybe shame, I hope that doesn't happen because shame doesn't really produce anything. But we have at least a level of remorse and we, we you know, turn away from our sin and this is what we normally do. We normally promise God, I'll never do that again. I promise you, God. Anybody ever done that? Come on now. And then about a minute later, maybe a week later, maybe a month later, you find yourself back in the same process because somehow, some way, you've misunderstood how God works in our life. It isn't through human effort. Our responsibility, our only responsibility, is to learn the principles of abiding in Jesus. And when I learn that, it's he that produces in me what he desires for me, and he prunes away what he doesn't want to have in my life. And, and the only way to have abundant fruit is to be involved in this process. So the third simple truth out of John 15 is simply this, is that you, this is your responsibility, this is it in a nutshell. I'm just gonna simply say, I run into very few Christians who really understand what it means to produce fruit and how it's produced. Most of the time, we think somehow, some way, I've gotta manufacture it. I've gotta be more obedient, I've gotta be more this, or I've gotta be more that, or I've gotta give more energy to this, I've gotta get up earlier, I've gotta work harder at it, but that's not what Jesus taught his disciples. What Jesus taught his disciples is right here, John 15, this is how holiness happens, this is how fruit happens in our life, and it is a, it is a must understanding, it really is. So this third simple truth is that you, you and me, are responsible to abide in Christ. 
So the million dollar question, the second million dollar question is how do I do that? Well, let's just read it from the text for a minute. John 15, 4 says, Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. Listen carefully. You have an addiction? You know how you get rid of your addiction? It is not through willpower. You have a, you, whatever it is, I don't care, you fill in the blank. If you want to produce fruit, the way you produce fruit, according to Jesus, and this is Jesus' teaching, the way that you do that is by abiding in him. It's my responsibility to abiding, abide in him. So here's the simple truth. Abiding isn't something you have to do. Listen to this, don't miss it. It's who I have to be. It's not something I'm doing. It's who I have to be. I have to be that that vine that rests, that, that, that branch that rests in the vine. To abide in Christ means to intentionally, listen to this, don't miss it, to intentionally remain in an ever-growing relationship with him in a way that transforms my character to be more like his character. My responsibility is to abide. So let me see if we can dig just a little bit deeper in that because this is really important for us to understand. All of nature depends on hidden resources, right? You think about a tree. The great trees send their roots down into the earth to draw out water and minerals, and, and the most important part of the tree is the part you can't see. The most important part of your walk with Jesus is the part that nobody else can see, not even you. His work is a supernatural work, and it's a work that he does as you learn to abide in him. And, I, and be patient, because I'm going I'm to talk about what that means in just a minute. Now think about rivers. Rivers have their source in the snow, you know, capped mountains from up above. So when we walk out and look at the Truckee River, the Truckee River has its source somewhere else. It's hidden from us. We don't naturally understand. We don't naturally look at the Truckee River and say, ah, that came from snow. It comes from a hidden resource. The most important part of the Christian life is the part that only God sees. And unless we draw upon the deep resources of God by faith, we, f we fail against all the pressures of this life. So let me see, if, let's just take it one step further. So what does it mean to, we're gonna talk about now, what does it mean to abide in Jesus? So when I was a young buck, when I was in my early 20s, I, I worked for a tungsten carbide refinery. I worked in a mill, and, and it was, you know, I would walk in the door, and in the early days, they didn't require you to wear, you know, ear protection, but today they do. And so, so I'd walk in, and it was deafening. The noise was deafening, and my wife now knows why I always say, what you, what'd you say? And, and it was just deafening, because it takes a lot of grinding. Listen to this. Don't miss this. It takes a lot of grinding to take tungsten ore and make it into fine particles. And it makes a lot of noise. It takes a lot of energy. It takes a lot of heat to do that. And, and so now think about that. Think about the noise that's produced in that tungsten refinery just to get this, this tungsten metal. Now, think about this. Think about the idea of a vineyard. On the contrary, when you walk into a vineyard, Go to Napa sometime, and just and they'll let you walk through, the, walk through the vineyard. And here's what you'll notice about the vineyard. You'll notice the quietness of the vineyard. You know why? Because it doesn't take any work to produce the grapes. It doesn't take, you don't have to grind it out. You're not ground, and this is how sometimes, this is what we miss. This is what we miss in the Christian life. Somehow, someway, I think, that I've got to grind out the Christian life. It's not true. You don't grind out the Christian life. You don't have to, you don't have to work harder. You don't, have to, you don't have to give more energy into it. You need to learn what it means to abide in him. There are three key words to describe abiding. These are my words, but let me suggest what they are, and then we'll talk about each one. First of all, I think to abide in Jesus means that I have the kind of relationship that I'm always connected to the true vine. I don't have an off day and, a, and a, you know, an on day. I don't have, it, you know, it's the idea that 24 seven, I understand my identity as the branch. I understand that that's my job. 
My job is to stay connected to Jesus. So the idea of connection is just this identity of knowing that it's not an on-again, off-again thing. It's not, it's not, you know, I have a secular life and a sacred life. It's that I have one life, one branch. I'm connected to this one true vine, and it's a 24-7 thing. So the idea of connection is huge. I just stay connected. The next key word that I would use here is the idea of dependence. It means that if there's any source of life, if I'm going to live, if I'm going to take my next breath, I have to stay connected to the vine. I'm just a branch. So I have to, I have to live in this dependent relationship to God, dependent for every element of my walk with Jesus. And then the next element would be the idea, or the next concept would be the idea of residence. I need to reside there. I need to take up my residence in Jesus. So these three key words, connection, dependence, residence. Say those with me. Let me say them one more time so you remember them. Connection, dependence, residence. Now you say them with me. Connection, dependence, residence. That's the idea of abiding in Christ. To abide is to reside. That's what it means. Now, if I'm going to do that, there are four key things that will happen in my life. This is how I know that I'm abiding in Jesus. So you be the judge. I'm not your judge. God is, but you can judge your own life. So you judge as to whether or not you're abiding in Jesus and will work backwards to maybe what you need to do. So there are four things that happen when I'm abiding in Jesus. This is not my opinion. This is what Jesus said. There are four results, and this is what they are. The first thing that I have when I abide in Jesus is that I experience the presence of Christ. Habitually, that's what I experience. I experience the, I don't feel separated from him. I am, I experience the presence of Jesus because I'm connected so closely to who he is. So I experience his presence and that's what he says in verse four. Abide in me and I in you. So when I'm, my responsibility is to abide, to take up residence, and but here's the marvelous thing about this is that when I do that, he abides in me. That's his presence. He takes up residence in my life and I know he's there because I can feel this kind of presence inside of my life and I can experience it. Then there's something else that happens. How do I know that I'm abiding in Jesus? The answer is because I possess the power of Christ. Verse five, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So the opposite of that is true, that when I'm abiding in Jesus, I'm experiencing his life-giving power so that I'm producing the kind of fruit that God has for my life. It is amazing to have that kind of power inside of my life. I'm not powerless. With Christ, with Christ, I have the same kind of power, listen to this, that raised Jesus from the dead. How do I know that I'm abiding in Jesus Christ? Because I have the habitual power of Christ in my life. I have victory over sin. As a general rule of thumb, doesn't mean I don't ever sin. It means that I generally have victory over sin as I abide in Jesus. It means that when I speak, I speak with the authority of Christ. And I have the power of Christ in the words that I'm speaking. And when I speak, others recognize that what I'm saying is not of myself. It's of God. That's the power of Christ. And then here's a, here's a big one. When I'm abiding in Jesus Christ, I have answered prayer. Now think about that. I have answered prayer. This is what Jesus said. Again, we don't want to look at this as a, a text today. These are, this is Jesus saying these things to his disciples. And this is what he says. So that, in the context of abiding, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. That's answered prayer. And by the way, guess what? When I'm abiding in him, I don't ask for stupid stuff. I ask for stuff that, I ask for stuff that would be the Father's will. And it's not natural, it's not forced, but out of my life comes natural answered prayer. So when I find myself in a place where I don't have answered prayer, 
Honestly, what I've got to learn to do is I've got to learn to work backwards and say, wait a second, am I disconnected to the vine, the true source of life? Because the natural flow of life, the way Jesus described it here, is that when I'm connected to him, out of that life, out of that lifestyle, comes natural answer to prayer. In fact, so much so that Jesus says these powerful words, that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will do. That's a pretty big statement. And so when I find myself with unanswered prayer, I've got to ask myself, am I really abiding in Jesus? And then, when you think it couldn't get any better than that, when I abide in Christ, I have the power of Christ, I have the presence of Christ, when you, didn't, when you couldn't think of, it could get any better than that, this is what Jesus says to his disciples 2,000 years ago, verse 11. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Joy. So when you are in a place where you are depressed, not because of medical, or, you know, chemical issues, but you're just discouraged with life. You got to step back from that and you have to say, wait a second here. The promise of abiding in Jesus is that my joy would be full. My joy would be full. It would be flowing over. It would be as full as the cup can get when I am abiding in Jesus. Because when I'm abiding in Jesus, I am not, I am not subject to all the circumstances. I get bad things that happen to me, certainly. But when I'm abiding in Jesus, what happens is, is that I'm so connected to Him that they have no effect on whether or not I have this joy. That's what the text says. My joy may be full. Is your joy full today? If your joy is not full, it's because perhaps you're trying to take the Christian life, you read the Bible, and you're thinking, gosh, this seems like, a, you know, too much. Have you ever thought that? This seems like it's too much. I mean, I can't keep up with that. It's because you've never meant to keep it. You've never been meant to keep up with it. You've been meant to be plugged in to the vine so that out of you flows a lifestyle that naturally obeys the things that Jesus says for us to do. It's as simple as that. And when you try to make Christianity a performance-based relationship, Here's what will always, here's what will always happen. You'll be robbed of joy, you have unanswered prayer, and you'll be frustrated because nobody can live that kind of life. So my counsel to you is just learn to abide in Jesus. Now, let's finish with this thought. I say all this to say, when I'm connected to Jesus, when I'm abiding in Jesus, I am never without hope. I'm never without hope. So I want to stop there for just a second and just say, some of you have heard this story, some of you have not heard this story, but several years ago I got an illness and I almost died and I was at wit's end and I can remember on numerous occasions coming in to this auditorium when it was empty and crying out to God and saying, God, do you hear my cry? Do you hear, do you see what's going on, God? And, and, I, and, I, and as I was crying out to God, as I cr cried out to God, God just spoke and he said, I want you to think about something, Dan. So what are your alternatives? Who else has the source and words of life? And my, ha my answer had to be, nobody does then why are you hopeless, Dan? Why are you hopeless? Because there's no one else that gives the source of true life. And once I realized that, once the lights came on and I saw that, I didn't, I didn't spend one more day in hopelessness. And here's why. Here's why. I'm connected to Jesus. And I'm never without hope because hope has a name. Hope has a name, 
and his name is Jesus.